Now, next up, we have a panel of RAS producers who will share their experiences and unique challenges of different species in the recirculating aquaculture system. Moderating this panel is David Kuhn, who is an associate professor at the Department of Food Science and Technology at Virginia Tech. Welcome, David. Thank you for the introductions today. Um, good oh. morning, good afternoon, good evening <laughs> to all the participants. Thank you for coming. I'm excited to be here today with this panel. We have Joe Cardenas, he's the founder and CEO of Aquaco. We have Tom Sorby, operation manager at Kingfish, Maine. And we have John Taylor, biology expert at Aquamoa Aquaculture Technologies. And so please come on board. And what we're gonna do is go around the room first and everyone's gonna provide a little background information about where they came from and what they're doing now in terms of positions. So Joe Cardenas. Well, hello, as mentioned, my name is Joe Cardenas, uh, CEO of Aquaco. We're based in Fort Pierce, Florida and raised Florida Pompano. Uh, we started site selection back in 2017, uh, placed our first fish in the tanks approximately July 2019. And initial operations was built as a commercial scale proof of concept. The species has been semi flirted with, you could say, long enough to have a good starting point especially in RAS, but vast majority of that work was typically in hatchery and, and on the juvenile stages versus grow out. So um, we Joe, learned a lot. I don't mean to interrupt you, but your webcam's not on. Okay, I apologize. Hmm, that's probably a good thing for the viewers, but for uh, <laughs> for me, I'll, I'll try to get it working here. One second. So still no, huh? Well, I apologize. So it shows you how much you prepare in a trial run. It worked all the time. So it worked earlier. <laughs> it sure did. Um, and it's working on my screen, but not yours. Hmm. Okay, so just continue on. <laughs> yeah, let me, I will try to work that as a panelist takes over here in a second um, with their intro. But but just briefly to touch on that um, and, and somewhat of a background of Aquaco, which we'll get into in a, a, a little bit further here into, into the dialogue. Um, we learned a lot in the two years that, that from 2019 to the end of 2021, where we, we basically ran a, a commercial scale proof of concept, as mentioned. And nobody likely learned more than me as I, I recently retired from banking at that time and, and really dove feet first. So we're now expanding to, to double that capacity. And that gets us to the kind of holy grail we'll, we'll talk about, which is actually making money in this industry. And I look forward to diving, like I said, into that as we get along here in the panel. So thanks for having me and appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Joe. Tom? Hi. Thanks, David. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm Tom Sorby. Uh, work for Kingfish Maine as the other operations manager with Megan. Um, I'm based in Maine right now. As you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not from the US. I'm originally from the UK. Uh, but I've been over here now for the past uh, like 11, 12 years working in aquaculture in various states. Um, right now, focused on uh, developing a project in Jonesport, Maine, uh, to uh, build a uh, large uh, land-based RAS facility to grow a cereola, uh, the landy. Uh, currently, right now, um, Kingfish, Maine is part of the Kingfish Company. Uh, the Kingfish Company has another farm uh, that's already been running since 2015 in uh, Zealand, which is in the southern part of the Netherlands, um, where they also grow uh, cereal alamdi, so yellowtail kingfish. Um, right now, we're almost through the permitting stage, uh, which we've been at for about three years now in Maine, uh, and we're hoping to break ground uh, at some point next year. Thank you, Tom. John? And thank you, David, and thank you also to Rastec for the invitation uh, to represent Aquamoa. So my former background, I've been now with Aquamoa nearly um, a year now, uh, formerly an academic by trade as a salmon physiologist uh, at the Institute of Aquaculture in Scotland, as you can probably all tell and hopefully understand my accent. Um, my role within Aquamoa is within the technology R&D department. Uh, but I also have a joint role in that in overseeing and working with our customer and client support and operations in Poland um, on the biological performance enhancement, including diets and welfare. 
Um, so there's a support role there, which I'm sure we'll come on to when we talk about sort of the company structure, as you'll see. Aquamorph is a technology provider, but again, I'm sure it'll come up in discussion. We actually operate with a diverse range of species. So I'll bring some experiences of those, although my background is principally salmonids. I'll bring in some of the uh, client builds and the partnerships we have in a variety of species. Thank you, John. So as we all know, there's a lot of media attention around salmon expansion globally. And um, but there's other really important candidate species, and everyone kind of introduced what species they work with in the previous introduction. But I wonder if we can go a little bit deeper. Um, so, Joe, for example, um, why did you pick Pompano? Get off mute. Um, a few reasons, and, and I'll try to keep it brief. Um, obviously, coming and looking at this from an outsider looking in in the industry, a um, little little tougher. Um, to narrow the field, but we chose Florida Pompano really first as a Florida-based company and a, and a selfishly a Florida native. There was a good level of market knowledge with the species. What we knew is that there's a very limited wild caught market that's very seasonal in, in the Southeast, and it's mostly limited to hook and line. This left a pretty wide open marketplace for a consistent weekly supply uh, that can come from an aquaculture uh, operation. Uh, second, there was some biological rationale. The initial density was acceptable, especially coming off a, you know, basically wild brood that we were dealing with. Uh, the grow out times were under a year uh, to harvest. And, and for obvious reasons, our average temps worked out to, to mirror similar tolerances to what the native Florida Pompano care for. So that that semi cut into and cut down operating costs for the for the for the species. And and really last, and this this will go on and probably bleed into a couple other segments, but the market price made our break even point lower than most producers, right? And so that was key to me looking at this fiscally, uh, which was more of my background before getting hands on, and that how do we get to that stage faster, sooner? We know we have areas and it's going to take time and years to build the efficiencies and cost as, as a prior person spoke about, but how does that not stop us? How do we not use scale as kind of to excuse the, the growth of an operation? And how can we do that at, at a, a shorter point? And so all those and, and a combination of others have made me both love and curse this species uh, in the last four or five years, but, but mostly love. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Joe. How about you, Tom? Um, I, I think for us, really, uh, well, initially, the, the, the Yellowtail kingfish is a very popular fish. You know, there's already a big market for it. Um, there is, there is obviously the, the wild wild fishery, uh, but there's not currently uh, or hasn't been a lot of uh, land based production of the species. And so, obviously, there's an opportunity there um, for us to to grow the species on land. And the nice thing is with RAS facilities, as we all know, you can generally put them anywhere you want in the world to some extent, um, so that you're right close to the market. And obviously that helps towards sustainability and reducing the carbon footprint. Um, of the other obviously key thing, which is a pretty generic answer, but is that, you know, Cereola does well in, in RAS, RAS systems. It gets to market size, uh, you know, relatively quickly between, you know, nine to 12 months. That's, you know, anywhere from 800, 800 grams to three kilos. Um, and so it kind of ticks all those boxes that you want to hit uh, when you're growing species on land, especially as we know, RAS has a high, High upfront capex cost, and so it may, you need to pick a species that'll get some either get to market size quickly, or a species that has a, commands a high market price, uh, so that you can you can uh, you can cover those initial uh, high capex costs. Thank you, Tom. And how about you, John? I know that you work with a lot of different species. Could you kind of describe that a little bit and why you picked them? Yeah, sure. I'll try and keep this quite short because there is quite an expansive range. I mean. Two factors which have obviously been brought up um, before in previous panels, but yes, there has to be a, a market sort of scale or at least pricing there in the farm gate values. Um, it's obviously been mentioned as well, we shouldn't just use this as a limit. Um, other things in some of the other species, maybe things like the availability of seed, uh, particularly of new upcoming species as we diversify, for example. I think in terms of Aquamorph, just to give you some context, our concept design and our technology, we've shown now that we can take the same RAS technology in effect and apply virtually to 
almost any species. Um, firmly start with tilapia, move to salmon. But for this session, of course, currently we are operating with partnerships with clients and some joint ventures um, on rainbow trout. Uh, again, good growth rates, tolerates reasonably high density, offers maybe slightly more diverse product opportunities than maybe a salmon because you can sell it 300 grams, 500 grams, two kilo, the filet market. Um, similarly, we have a sister company, Eco Shrimp, that I'm sure everybody's familiar uh, or potentially familiar with, uh, based in Israel, started as an R&D. Um, high value species, as we know, some challenges, unlike the finfish species. Um, but the technology design, again, is there. Um, again, brought up in previous panel, for example, in Slovakia, we also have African catfish, Clarius. Low value species generally, but again, selling points to those species are high volume to offset a lower, lower price. So really it's about, you know, the technology itself that we offer as a technology provider can be really adapted to any and it's that capex opex versus the market and volumes that um attract into different uh different species just to give uh some short examples of the species we work with thank you john my next question gets into the engineering a little bit because i'm always curious about how we design systems to culture these different species and so joe i was wondering if you could go a little bit into detail about pompano and and your system and how you minimize your impacts on the local community in terms of discharge water? Yeah, I mean, listen, this was part of my gut wrenching the first year or so. Again, the outsider looking in was so many options, so many variables, so many different vendors of which to choose. I'd say the only benefit in, in kind of starting as a you know commercial scale proof of concept is that we're not really big enough to to <laughs> want to entertain one or just two providers. You know, we we I kind of called it the Frankenstein approach, you know, to aquaculture, you know, the best drums, the best skimmers, the best pumps, you name it, um, from all over the industry. And, and to help that, you know, I needed people much smarter than me. And we, we hired an initial team of, of, of consultants and um, probably a few of them listen in or on the call because they're they've heavily involved in other projects. But Paul Hunley um, was a great help to us in helping us in our, our growth plans, which I'll talk about. Uh, Dr. Nick Brown who's uh, based now on the West Coast, but but a huge help. And of course, I also, because of my level of high ignorance early on, you know, incorporate that into our staffing model, right? So our first team member, especially our, our director of operations was Dan Farkas. And Dan had years of experience in the field and, and he was part of that team that helped design and engineer. So it was a, democracies are usually good. You could argue in business sometimes um, if that works out, but I will say it, it was, uh, the benefit of what we did. Um, so part of that me, you know, just to translate, we have a typical RAS system, right? But but with enough customizations that helped us in cost savings, which was incredibly important to us and well, everybody, but and and really help with ongoing operational costs. So we keep makeup water under 5%. Um, and our intake is directly off the intercoastal waterway, about three miles from a major inlet. So we get good flow. Um, we just have a basically a horizontal bore of incoming water that we have to treat from a primary. So yes, it's a well, but I, I treat it more as, you know, you're basically treating it as, as you know, somewhat surface water. Um, the first phase relied on solid removal and then basic percolation, you know, to handle our effluent. So everything was self-retained on site. Uh, we have about eight and a half, nine acres here along the coast. Um, not huge, but enough to where you could sacrifice some to that that percolation and 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 uh, assistance. As we continue to grow, the plans are you know are anything that's not percolating goes through constructed wetlands, polished, and then with approval through through final. Uh, but again, we're at right now we're at 15, 20 gallons per minute at max. Um, as we double now, is which we're doing might get to 30, 35 gallons per minute. So pretty pretty low from the water transition standpoint. Um, but we take that seriously. And, and like I said, there's advantages and some disadvantages to keep your influent and effluent on the surface versus deeper wells. But 
that's one of the advantages. Uh, we're pretty much an open house where you could watch the water as it comes in all the way till it, you know, the last drop goes out, you know, through the building and so forth. So uh, it's worked well for us. Like I said, there's, there's trade-offs, but in our case and how we operate coastal, um, to me, there's a lot more advantages than disadvantages than, than being further inland in the state. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Joe. Just like, out of curiosity, what's the salinity of, salinity of the water there? It does vary. Um, this will, for the weak of heart or the species that don't have a high tolerance, um, unlike Pompano, uh, we see anywhere from 35 parts down to sometimes low 20s, um, depending on runoff and so forth and and the tidal change and tidal flux. Now, obviously, with RAS, we, we see those impacts um, over a, you know, a lot of time. And, and I'd say we, we've averaged and maintained anywhere in the high 20s, low 30s salinity in our systems. And None of that happens, like I said, at, at, at a very quick rate. So our fish are pretty tolerant of those salinity changes um, that we have here. Okay, good to hear. I've also heard that Pompano is pretty tolerant to nitrates. Is that correct? Yeah. Compared they, to other marine species. I will say yeah. they're very forgiving overall. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'd like to say we learned a lot of lessons, um, especially in those first couple of years of proof of concept. But but finding those extremes, right? Yeah, um, there's still a lot of buttons to push. You know, they're not the highest density yet because of you know kind of where we're starting with F1s and then our brood. Um, we've learned a lot through diet, um, you name it. But they have a their tolerances are pretty wide in terms of salinity, temperature. I mean, we've had tanks that are down to 18, 19 C, and we've had it at 31, 32. Um, that's what a proof of concept's for, right? Really prove those out. We found a sweet spot. Not, not in those extremes, but uh, for, from a growth curve standpoint, but they are pretty tolerable compared to most, yes. All right, thank you, Joe. Tom, do you wanna speak a little bit about the systems you're using for cakefish, yellowtail? Yellowtail yeah, cakefish? I, I think, you know, we're kind of, we're using the standard brass systems like everybody else. So I think I'll kind of focus more on the back end of things, especially in terms of that uh, environmental impacts and minimizing those. Uh, I think, you know, the two big kind of, uh, byproducts from from RAS production in general is you've got a, a wastewater discharge of some description and then you've got a lot of the solids that you have to deal with. Uh, in terms of our of our of our wastewater discharge, we we are we are drawing from the surface. So we're drawing our water in from Channel Bay, um, where we're located and we're discharging that water back in back into that bay. So it's it's critical that we we minimize any environmental impact on that because we're use, we're reusing that water essentially. Uh, in Maine um, uh, we have to we have to apply for what's called a discharge permit, and that focuses the primary the big focus of that is the the nit nitrate levels uh, in the discharge. So the the DEP uh, sets the limit that you're allowed to discharge, um, and we obviously have to be within that limit. Otherwise, we we are granted the permit. Um, so our big focus is uh, is on how do we uh, maximize the efficiency of our wastewater discharge. Um, most wastewater discharge treatment. Um, has all been developed around freshwater, and so we're take, we, we are taking technology from um, freshwater uh, wastewater treatment and you know implementing it with our saltwater discharge. Um, and for all it does work, uh, it's not as efficient. Uh, there's definitely a lot more research that needs to be done in you know maximize the efficiency of of, uh, of di treating discharge water when it's in a, a purely uh, saltwater saltwater discharge. Um, so in addition to like minimizing the amount of nitrates that we use for, so we obviously implement, uh, denitrification, um, we have to do a lot of ongoing monitoring in the bit as well. So the state DEP, so the Department of Environmental Protection, um, has, has, uh, set out a number of sites around Chandler Bay that we have to monitor throughout, throughout the year through, especially through May and October, because obviously this is the peak time when, um, algal blooms could be. Could be an issue, and that's so. That's when they want us to focus on our on our uh, our sampling. Um, the sampling is carried out by a third party third party company, uh, and we have to test temperature. We sample for temperature, salinity. I've got the list down here because well, uh, there's depth, dissolved oxygen, pH, chlorophyll, turbidity, TKN, uh, total phosphorus, nitrate plus nitrite, and extracted chlorophyll. So there's a lot of things that we have to we have to test for throughout those months, um, and obviously. From our own perspective, um, we don't want to be uh, disrupting disrupting the bay in any way because we 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 need that water. Um, so I think it's 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 just it, this this level of of monitoring that has to go on um, 
it gives the general public a lot more confidence in the process of what's going on. Um, the other, the other kind of key component that I'll just touch on as well is the, obviously the amount of fish sludge that we produce or any uneaten feed or just the fish, fish feces. Uh, to give you an example, at full production, we're estimated to producing about 25 tonnes of this every day. Um, so it's a large volume of sludge to deal with. Um, the easy thing to do, but not really, not the best thing to do is obviously just take that off the landfill. You, you, that is an option, uh, but that's not something we want to do. So we've been um, working with a, a local company called AgriCycle, uh, who work on, uh, they, they deal with biogas production. Um, and so we're uh, yeah, collaborating with them right now uh, to look at them, have them take away our, our fish sludge and they can mix it in with uh, their regular, you know, manure from terrestrial animals uh, to produce biogas. Um, again, this is another place where more research uh, would be very helpful for, especially for the saltwater rats industry, because because our, we're purely growing in salt water, our sludge is salty, so we can't just go spread it on fields for uh, as fertilizer for crops. It doesn't work as well. Uh, you can't just put it in a biogas reactor on its own either. It has to get right now. It has to get mixed with terrestrial manure to, to drop that salinity. Um, so it'd be nice in an ideal world if someone could figure out how we take the salty fish sludge that we produce and, you know, how do can we build a biogas plant that will work efficiently just with our, our waste? Because then again, that's something we could put potentially on site if we had space or close to the site to, to minimize the where we have to move it uh, and produce biogas. Um, so they're kind of the two big uh, environmental uh, aspects that we're, we're working on. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, it sounds like it has some challenges with the sludge a lot. Um, I know that the salt content is a big issue for you, so I'm glad you found partners to explore new avenues for energy production and a use for it. Um, John, um, so I know you work with a lot of different species. Um, I'm particularly curious about shrimp yeah. and the clear water yeah. versus bioflock debate, which system to use. So could you describe that a little bit as well? So, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, um... On that sort of aspect, I think, you know, hearing everybody talk, as we keep saying, more research is needed. I think this is where Aquamoa uh, and our sister companies, uh, EcoShrimp there, have that luxury of actually having R&D facility, you know, first and foremost, to actually test and learn before we upscale and try on, you know. We're all learning as we go. Um, Certainly, that's allowed us uh, then or, and, or Eco Shrimp to learn by trial and error over six years. You know, 2016 started as R&D, uh, 15 plus batches of uh, post larvae brought in and through to market during that to test all these concepts. Certainly, the evidence uh, suggests that based on the results from there, that clear water is definitely beneficial based on that experience. It has to be of course then supplemented with um nutritional input as uh components which is then spurred on further interest and joint venture collaborations um towards working out better nutritional requirements of shrimp for example um it's also allowed um slightly higher densities and allowed us to push the densities um to a much higher level you know again we know ras has some um, uh, some significant advantages over uh, which i'm sure will come on to as well relevant to the environment but we can push that productivity but there is a limit but on the clear water system with some in tank alterations and a few sort of trade not necessarily trade secrets but adaptations to suit uh, and improve the density conditions for shrimp, we're now starting to be able to push those boundaries beyond what is traditionally being experienced. And of course, the clear water system, again, through trial and error, um, has seen an improvement in the overall water quality and stability. And that's something, again, of not just in shrimp, but the other species, we have seen that this application of the technology, what's a modification to the species, is producing time and time again very consistent and reliable uh, environmental conditions which then helps us with good bio plans which means you actually have predictable stock performance so you can really benchmark yourself um, 
what adaptations you've made because you don't have so much environmental noise there that you can make an adjustment and oh that really is a pe positive benefit because within reason we've minimized um a lot of the um, uh, that background noise of other factors so i would say on that you know for for the environmental discharge you know really all the systems center around low carbon footprint per kilo that's inclusive of shrimp as well we want to get our volumes up um our systems operate generally on minimal pumping again if nobody's familiar with the uh, aqua uh, more um technology we do not use for example drum filtration we rely on solid separation actually starting in tank for example so we reduce electrical costs there um we also use unlike the fixed bed and moving bed bioreactors it's the same in shrimp and the finfish species uh we use um trickling bio towers uh, as our main not only for nitrogenous waste management, but uh, to help in gas stripping. So again, we're removing components in the traditional RAS systems that are electrically expensive, increasing in our OPEX. So it's all about trying to bring that down in addition to um, quite an advanced denitrification system, allowing us to operate at around about 1% or less uh, actual water exchange. So we really are trying to go to minimal, if not zero liquid discharge uh, for the future. And again, the R&D facilities allow us to refine and refine and refine to then implement into the client builds. Thank you, John. Um, my next question is gonna go kind of to the business side of things a little bit um, in terms of vertical integration, um, for example, if you don't have your own hatchery, you can um, create a biosecurity risk for your facility. So I'm wonder, wonder, wondering if each of you could speak a little bit about um, how vertically integrated you are, um, you know, from hatchery to processing. So Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, it's probably one of the biggest lessons learned for Aquaco. We we started by outsourcing the the, the fry, uh, basically in fingerlings and bringing them in because we wanted to get a head start on the grow out, which which were most of the learning opportunity was for Pompano. And, and truth be told, I say a, learn, a valuable lesson because it's that reliance on third party, especially for a novel species, right? If there was 10 Pompano hatcheries to go to a little bit different story, but, but we had one in particular that we used and it was, it was challenging. Um, you know, any, I, I, you know, impact there would impact us greatly. So about a year, year and a half into operation, we, we had to make that quick decision and, and budget reconciliation to say, we need to start the brood. We need to start the hatchery sooner than a plan. And we did. And thank God to a good team, we got it off the ground relatively quickly. But that was about the only vertical integration point we we're missing. Obviously, we don't have the scale to even talk about, you know, feed and, and processing. We're fortunate in that all of our pompano go out the door unprocessed. You know, these are whole ungutted fish. Um, that the buyer wants and, and in that form. So, so we don't really have a processing need either. So other than, you know, you can never limit yourself what you want to take in, but scale eventually will dictate that for us. And, and right now, outside of, of the risk being we're the only, <laughs> um, you, know, uh, you know, main grower here in the U.S., um, I'd love to see more. I, I think that would only open the door to have some, some second and third choices out there if, if um, that integration just isn't enough and you need more. But for now, uh, we're 100 percent self-sufficient on the on the bio stage and and uh you know plan plan on re remaining that way great thank you joe how about you tom um well for us the goal will be to be fully integrated all the way from from hatchery all the way to grow out and processing um it's actually one of our biggest challenges right now in maine um is we need to build up our brew stock population uh, and we can't just go catch them off the coast here, unfortunately. Uh, so we have to figure out ways of how do we go about building up that population. Uh, we are, where we are in CCAR right now, which is the uh, UMIN Centre for Cooperative Aquaculture Research in Franklin, Maine. Uh, we have, we're renting, we're renting rooms here and we've been building up uh, hatchery systems for the past uh, two or three years while we've been here. A uh, big focus on building a quarantine system and then uh, also some uh, brew stock systems. So we have the capacity to hold about 300 brew stock, you know, plus or minus, depending on the side. Um, and so now the systems are more or less ready and we need to fill them. Um, there's a couple of ways we're going to go about this. 
the main way we're probably going to be is that we're looking at how can we ship large adult fish or they're from the Netherlands facility because they have a lot of brew stock there with good mix of genetics because they've got fish, uh, you know, they've got genetics mixed from down in Chile, from Aquanor and uh, from a couple of places in Australia. Um, so right now, from a genetic diversity standpoint, we're in good stead. Um, and it's just a case of how do we bring these brew stock over. So we're focused right now on figuring out a way that we can ship these large fish. And there's a lot of logistics, as you can imagine, that go with that. It's relatively easy to ship small fish, which we could do. We, we could fish, ship the larvae over, you know, in a bag with oxygen in a box. Uh, but then we still have to grow that fish out for another three to four years before it's even, you know, at a point where it's going to be producing as any eggs or milk. Um, so we want to kind of shorten that, shorten that step get adult fish in as quickly as possible so that we can get those conditioned, get them onto a photo period and get them at least in, in spawning condition so that we can spawn them while they're here and eventually move them to the root, the facility in Jones Bar, which will have its own separate hatchery. And so right now that's what the, the, we're going back and forth and we're, we've pretty much figured out a way that we think should work. Uh, we're hoping to move some fish uh, in November. Um, but there's still a lot of logistics. The quickest we can ship them over in is it still take about 40 hours because of the shipping is it all goes dangerous goods because essentially we have the, the fish pack system, which some people might be familiar with. Essentially, it's a big blue tote with an oxygen cylinder in. Um, the issue with that, because it has to go dangerous goods, it ha it'll stop on its way across in Iceland and then carry on to Boston. We'd have to drive down to Boston, pick them up and bring them up to, up to, to Jonesport. So it's it's a long trip uh, for large fish. Uh, there's a few other logistical details that are challenging just with the, people may not think of oxygen bottles, oxygen cylinders in the US uh, are not approved in Europe, um, but you can't use a European one when it comes to the US either. So what we've had to do is we had to buy a US bottle, ship it over to the Netherlands where they can't fill it directly at a place. You have to get, they have to get a Dutch, a European bottle with a special transfer hose to fill that, the US bottle. But you can't put the US bottle in until right before it goes on the flight, because while it's on the road, it has to be a European bottle. So there's a, just just those real small details become a massive headache when you're trying to figure out how to move uh, a large fish. So uh, yeah, that's the, the big big challenge that we're, we're, we're dealing with right now so that we can be fully integrated here in May. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, John, I'm gonna skip over you on that question just because we have seven minutes left and I do want to get some audience questions so if you want to field this first one go ahead or anyone could answer it um, the first question is what potential do you think there is for other species like oysters mussels and macro algae and saltwater wrasse um yeah I, I I truly believe that anything is actually possible with wrasse I mean we've We've seen the impact, you know, of uh, COVID-19, for example, on our food security. So it's maybe made us think a little bit more beyond just, you know, oh, we need this. But where is our food going to come from for the future? And, you know, maybe to consider these, it, you know, not necessarily just pandemics, other interruptions to the supply chain, of course, the carbon footprints of transportation and everything. So, um Yes, in theory, there is, um, you know, there are definite possibilities there. I guess it's always weighing up, you know, could you use algae better as a human product direct, you know, rather than grow one thing to then feed to another, for example. That's maybe in the, that's right, but definite scope, though, for rats and more biosecure seed and spat production for example for um many shellfish species um i'm no great expert on it but former colleagues were so there was always that thought so i won't say too much on that with the short time and let others have a have a chance for input there thank you john i'm going to move on to the next question and give everyone opportunity to answer it um do you see all flavors in your system and what technology do you use to address it or what are you trying out to, to address it so go ahead joe yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, we we actually built our original design, assuming um, we'd had to have a somewhat separate purge system or otherwise at the at the risk of off flavor. Again, um, as someone point out in the Q and A too. Yeah, you know, others others have raised Pompano. You know, we're we're not re completely reinventing the wheel, 
but not a lot of data was ever out there or discussion point in terms of was there off flavor issues, right? And every design will be different as well. So we, we built our system incorporating it, tried it, ended up not needing it after, you know, at least I'd say call it three to six months of, of, of sampling and so forth and, and, and presenting in front of buyers. And there was no off flavor, you know, fortunately from our systems. And so we bypass it. That is now our <laughs> part of our, our, uh, our nursery system. Now those four tanks that were in a separate system. Um, so something that's always relevant. Um, you know, we actually are trying a little bit different harvest technique um, as, as, as we're done expanding here and coming back a little bit greater size and actually using some EKG may because we see a portion of our product going to sushi sashimi market and that equipment has developed um, and, and, you know, a harvest technique to where it's now viable at a commercial scale to do so. I'll tell you that in January and February when we when we try that for the first time uh, on the batches we have going through now, but that'll be interesting and and see if it has any impact on taste and flavor. I, I, I my gut says yeah we're trying it for a reason and that, and that it only improves that especially from the the raw standpoint. Uh, but but truth be told, we'll we'll find out. Thank you, Joe. Does any does Tom or John have anything to add? Uh, it, I mean for us. We while we do see it, it's not really been a big issue because it's relatively easy for us to deal with. So we haven't actually had to implement any special technology at the moment to deal with it. That's not to say in the future that it might not become more of an issue as the systems mature or you know, when we build a site in John Spot, maybe there's something just water chemistry wise that's not obviously to 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 pick up uh, that's different to the Netherlands. Uh, so right for example, right now the fish go in a purge tank, the purge tank receives all the the new water that comes into the building before that goes to the you know, the RAS system. So, you know, they, they're off feed for a couple of days. They see that the, they're in the, the tank that's full of the, the fresh new incoming water. And that's so far all we've had to do to, to deal with that. Thank you, Tom. And yeah, just a very short comment on that. I saw in the question there. Yes, specifically things like catfish. Um, yes, off flavor, I think, is there in a variety of species as we're hearing. Some species may be more predisposed depending on their adiposity and their fat deposition as well. The classics are the salmonids in particular, a lot of fat in that uh, muscle tissue as well as a main fat depot. So certain other species may be more prone to, or less prone, for example, in some of the whitefish species, they will still uptake, but maybe you have a lessened problem and less requirement for extensive purge or anything that the sector or certain parts of the sector are facing. Thank you, John. Um, this question is specifically for Tom. It could be answered probably pretty briefly. Um, Tom, what do you expect your electricity use per kilogram of whole fish to be? No, I can't do maths off the top of my head very well, but we'll be using between 10 and 15 megawatts. That's how much power we'll use. Divide that by the six to 8,000 metric tons we'll be producing, I guess. So, okay. No. So get out your calculators, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this question is for Aqua Moaf. Um, how is Aqua Moaf dealing with sulfates and metal accumulation in your zero discharge systems? So um, that's actually a very good question. Um, one of the, or what we feel one of the, the beauties of the way the system operates is we have effectively three, four levels of oxygenation and aeration as it move, as the entire water volume moves through every component. We also, and this is even the case in salmon as well, for example, and I should mention this right at the start, all these are low salinity, um, um, you know, uh, rearing environments, one, two PPT or zero PPT in some, you know, very minor background. So the additional risk through seawater input, of course, yes, feeds contribute, but we find that we believe and we monitor H2S. We've had no touch wood in any of the facilities H2S related events at all. And we strongly believe that that is um, through the efficiency of the, the multiple components and the way that the system operates slightly differently. Our DN DNS, like others, do generate, but we're again various steps of aeration, etc., and oxidation to reduce that that risk. So, possibly some aspects of that in the actual design concepts are beneficial, particularly um, in the low salinity systems. 
Okay, thank you, John. Well, it is now 1.20. Our session is coming to an end. And I just wanna thank um, Joe, Tom, and John for being here today and having, having this discussion with us, with, with all of us. And I know we did not get, out, get to all the questions. So I apologize for that. Maybe they, the uh, panelists will take a few minutes to go through. I look for directed questions to them 